We are inundated these days with insider information about media. I know more about most celebrities' careers than I know about my own. But once upon a time, previews of coming attractions were a special treat and movie studios were a mystery. Walt Disney built much of his television empire on exactly that. Announcements about progress on animated films and Disneyland were key primetime viewing. And one of the most massive, if not the first, of these backstage tours was The Reluctant Dragon. Comedian Robert Benchley is convinced by his wife to go to the Disney studios and try to sell Walt on a charming book by Kenneth Graham, whose Wind in the Willows, as I've mentioned before, is a personal favorite of mine. Benchley bumbles around the studio, comically learning about the craft of animation and, conveniently, upcoming Disney products. It's a formula the studio would repeat in the 1980s with Disney Studio Showcase, and more recently with the Disney Plus series Prop Culture. There's a faint plot with Benchley pursued by an overzealous young security officer and escorted by a sexy ink and paint artist. His studio adventures introduce him to a who's who of Disney studio legends, Clarence Nash, Jimmy McDonald, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson, Ward Kimball, and much more. Benchley blunders into the ink and paint department, where they pull the Wizard of Oz trick and switch the film into brilliant technicolor. Ink and paint, apparently, is populated only by hot chicks. Now, this is a fantasy film. Please see the book by Mindy Johnson for a more realistic view of the ink and paint club. The Reluctant Dragon is punctuated with animated mini-features, which showcase steps in the animation process. Baby Weems, about a hyper-intelligent newborn, is essentially a lesson in storyboarding. Goofy and Donald are each featured in shorts that emphasize the importance not just of drawing, but in between. Tweening. The section on sound effects features an alternate version of the Casey Jr. sequence from Dumbo. Finally, Benchley reaches Walt, who politely shows him the finished version of the book that Benchley's been trying to sell, The Reluctant Dragon. The Reluctant Dragon is the most important of the film's several animated sequences, and it's very funny. A few minutes earlier, we had been entertained by mainstream 1940s tract housing, mini golf, and mahjong. And now suddenly we're thrust into this world where a frustrated child demands that a campy dragon and an effeminate knight live up to their social expectations, to which the dragon says, Sweet little upside down cake, cares and woes, you've got them. Poor little upside down cake, your top is on your bottom. And the knight says, Sprinkle the salt on the top of your head. <laughs> Delicious. Now, how this got past the Hayes Code and the studio execs is beyond me, but it's all very, very funny, and I've loved it since my childhood. Overall, The Reluctant Dragon is a brilliant, if dated, studio tour. We see voice actors, maquettes, the multiplane camera, and legendary animators, but dated is exactly why it persists. Mid century style just seeps infectiously through the screen. The airline chair is featured prominently in the final scene, as are the Kim Weber designed desks and the very cool entry office. The great Disney historian and animator David Bosser recently put out an entire book on the mid century furniture of the Disney studios. He writes movingly about his attachment to his own Kim Weber designed animator's desk, and the enthusiastic collaboration between Weber and Disney as they designed the new Burbank Studios, a collaboration so close that very little written correspondence between them exists today. Form and function were absolutely wedded, which is disappointing when you think about the early Disney Renaissance period where brilliant artists lived in a guerrilla warfare life in off-site trailers. Bossert's book paints a picture of a very 1940s Hollywood, where desks were built to withstand cigarette burns and stash a bottle of bourbon, and a subterranean tunnel was built between studio buildings which was used more often for trysts than for transporting art. There's an odd segment in the film where Benchley slips into a nude modeling section hoping to get a glimpse, and the model turns out to be an elephant. Benchley's ogling of Francis Gifford also comes off very mad men. Things have changed. None of the furniture Walt so carefully designed for his new Burbank studio makes sense with modern technology, and thankfully, neither does the sexual politics. I could do more on my laptop than the massive vertigo-inducing multiplane camera could manage. The Reluctant Dragon, conceived as a cheap promotional film, thrives as a snapshot of the 1940s in Hollywood. It's showing off, and Disney certainly had plenty to show off. Soaking up the 1940s environment is intoxicating, and it's amazing to see Walt building his new corporate environment.